Welcome to the Compass Podcast. Today, we're joined by Wolfie Zhao, a researcher and former Bitcoin mining journalist at The Block. Wolfie digs into current 2022 narratives, including the public mining industry, the finance market for mining, and the manufacturing game. Wolfie, thanks for joining today on the, the Compass Podcast. Really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. Good to see you again. Yeah, great to see you also. It's been a few months. I think we had you last time on the podcast in November with David Pan from Coindesk just talking about Bitcoin mining, Bitcoin and journalism. So a very different conversation than today. Uh, but that was a good conversation. I think anyone who's been in the media space for a while always likes talking about media. Uh, but mm-hmm. today we're going to Talk a little bit more about Bitcoin mining and the research that you do at The Block. Uh, so excited yeah. for that. Cool. Let's jump into it. Yeah. So there's definitely like a lot of different conversation topics that we can nail. I think that we should probably stick to the purview of, of your work at The Block as a, as a researcher. Uh, I think just the depth of understanding of the mining market you have is really going to help out here since you've been covering also as a reporter for many years. You might. Are you the, the longest standing Bitcoin mining journalist. I feel like you could be up there for a record. Um, I don't know. I mean, I started You're covering not like. Track. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't keep track, but I started like end of 2018, I guess, around like when Bitman was filing for that IPO in Hong Kong. Um, yeah, and then have been keeping track of the space. That was you know at that time like the mining thing in China was pretty big and dominant, so uh, a lot of activities, and then. Yeah, I, I switched to the research side of the blog like around December last year. And now I just focus fully on mining related research pieces for our clients. Um, so yeah, I mean, over the past like couple of months, we did a, several, a series of uh, research pieces uh, touching on basically, I guess, most of the parts of the ecosystem. I think what's, what's pretty good is that, you know, over since like, I think 2018, between 20, 2018 and 2020, there weren't there weren't many like public listed mining companies. We're just like hand of them, maybe like two or three. Um, so the information that was public was really not so much, very little publicly available data. So a lot of time you know, would rely on you know, on-chain data because but like you know, on-chain data was only about the whole network was doing. So you can't really drew into like different companies per se. But I think in 2021, we saw like a pretty big increase of companies that are listed, at least uh, getting access to the public markets and they are all filing different kind of kinds of disclosures of their business, how they're operating their hash rate, their, their future plans, their investor presentations, SEC filings. Um, now I kind of like maybe we have two dozens of public listed companies with big or small market cap, and there are a couple of others that are pending listing. I think like four or five pending listing. So hopefully, like by the end of this year, we'll see like maybe thirty of them um, that can give a lot of good information about their business and using it as a kind of proxy for us to understand more how these companies are doing and all that. So I think. You know, some of the quick highlights of what we have done so far, I think a lot of the North American mining companies, they, they placed like big orders last year, buying, I think like million units of ASICs, um, like S19 or equivalent models that are due to due for shipments in 2022 and 2023. So there's a lot of hash rate that can be added to the network if the manufacturers can ship the equipment on time and but also at the same time like i think everybody's like now currently the, the supply shortage is not really about the equipment but like who, who can build the who can complete the infrastructure build out the the soonest um so that they can plug in the machines much faster um and i think that is what's also going on i i, I look through some of the findings and press releases i think there are about like dozen to to 20 mining companies are building multi gigawatts of capacity globally that kind of like five six gigawatts and over four gigawatts are, are in the u.s and a lot of them are in texas for sure 
Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely interesting that we have so many like construction projects going on and are expected to complete this year and next year and plugging the, the mining equipment gradually as they, you know, complete the infrastructure phase by phase. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's definitely it's definitely a growing growing market and it's a totally different game now than last year. Yeah, I'm trying to think of how many miners went public last year or at least in, in some form or fashion went public or were going public uh, through like SPACs, IPOs or direct listings. It's like around 15 to 20 and there's supposed to be like a, a bunch more this year. There's definitely a lot more information than we've gotten in the past. Uh, I'm just personally curious going back into what you're saying a second ago, there's only a lot of on-chain data in 2018, 2019, 2020. And now we have all this, this, like this dearth of public information for miners, which prior mining really operated in this very opaque sector, right? It was very hard to get information, you, hard to get into a mine, hard to get information out of manufacturers about what they're building, hard to get information about future deployments. Uh, I'm assuming like your job's a lot easier now, but, or maybe it's not the case because there's so much more information to parse through. Yeah. I think, I think what's like, what's different for like a Bitcoin mining related re research is that there are a lot, of, um, a lot of the information is not on chain. So you can't really put data just, just from, from the blockchain. Like a lot of the things they, they do interact with the blockchain, but the way they disclose it, it's not really from the blockchain itself. So like you have to look through all of the findings and yeah, the findings can be can be super long and you know interesting details of, are often buried in you know small paragraphs bypassing and you know you just have to find it. And so it's good that we have more transparency per se. Uh, it's just like getting those information is also an interesting process. Um, um, and and also like for example, like we previously were hard to um, really calculate the mining cost um, as a comp from a company perspective, right? You, you can say like, I bought all of S19 pros and then I can get a rough estimate. If I have like five cents USD per kilowatt hour, I can know what's the break even price. But, you know, when you put it into a business, there are all of other things that you can, you need to add on that. You, it's not just the cost of revenues. You need to hire a lot of people to maintain this facilities. You have office, you're now a public company that you have to be governed in a more professional and structured way. So you have to have a lot of more costs that needs to be added. And these kind of details, uh, and now we're, we're, we're able to get. Um, so it, it, it's definitely more interesting, like, if you look at uh, S19 Pro, we'll have like maybe 4K, 5K break even price for cost of my money, one Bitcoin. But when you add into all the cost of revenues and also all the operating cash based expenses, you know, paying for your executives, office rent, and all the other stuff, things can go up. Um, but to what, to what extent? Like that is what we can get from the public data. Um, so it's actually higher than, you know, what what companies will say for sure um but but given bitcoin price is still like 40k i think it's yeah still a pretty profitable business even though we're down from all time high um by a lot um so yeah, yeah definitely hash price is still doing doing pretty good i don't know if you track that metric very much but uh, you still mean the, pretty solid the revenue per tower hash mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah yeah uh, i mean yeah the hash rate I think year to day, like for the past three months, it has grown, um, I think like 10% from 180 to like now 200. Um, and it's not really moving really rapidly so far um, over the last like, I guess two cycles. Um, but yeah, that's also interesting. Like people saying, you know, we, we can see the maybe 300 or even 300, over 300 exa hash by the end of the year. Um, I think based on the purchases that people made, it's entirely possible. If you have like over 1 million ASICs, like S19s, they, they, they already have like 100 exahash additional, but always depends on like how many miners you can energize, right? Um, 
like some companies have a lot of the miners that re they receive sitting idle in the warehouse. Um, there are a lot of delays of, of, I guess, like construction and also logistics. It's kind of a pain to see like a lot of opportunity costs. You had that tweet about Marathon, which yeah. is really interesting. That was from a disclosure, like an investor note. Yeah, there, it, it's good that they they disclose that every month um, how many they received uh, from BMN, how many they plug in. Um, so like the last time I saw they the year today, like since like maybe 2021, early 2021, they received like over 100,000 ASICs from BMN. Um, at some moment, at some point, like later last year, they even used like charter flights to ship the equipment because the logistics was pretty disrupted due to the pandemic. So they have a lot of like over a hundred thousand. And then I think as of end of February, they plucked in like some 3.8 cash. So not, not less than 40% of the miner were energized. So the amount of miners that, that aren't energized can deliver Bitcoin that is more than what they generate in a month. So it's kind of pain. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's definitely like a narrative. And I think that's a good place to take the conversation is narratives we've seen from last year moving into this year and narratives at the moment as well. And it seems like the logistics thing is not going away. Like that was certainly a thing last year, but it, it's changed a little bit where now it's supply bottlenecks for building facilities with uh, orders going forward. And like these public miners have put a lot of orders up and it means delivering them, but they don't seem to be any place to, to place the machine. So Compute North is the hosting provider for a lot of what Marathon does and uh, seems to be having some construction delays or something. And that's causing Marathon to just leave machines on the ground. Is that right? Yeah, I think I think they definitely are trying to like resolve the problem as soon as possible. I mean, it's, it's a huge opportunity cost. Like, what 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 can six six exahash do? Like, I don't know. At least dozens of Bitcoin. Yeah, um, a day. It's a lot of so, Bitcoin. <laughs> that blows. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess I guess the China crackdown really like like, like messed up like kind of like a butterfly kind of the the, the the ripple effect is just like larger than people thought it's just it's not just about shutdown right it's this whole hosting capacity crunch like when they when those companies ordered the machines they didn't foresee that those chinese companies were rushing to you know elsewhere in the world to to source to source electricity um but yeah i think i think we need some time to like digest all that kind of demand but hopefully like construction will go on as you know, face by face. Yeah, it's a good way of putting it, like the butterfly effect of all these things. Uh, I think it also gets really interesting when you look at the public moves that firms like Marathon are making uh, with capital markets, putting out like convertible notes, stuff like that. Maybe dive into that a little bit. I know you've done some recent research speaking about uh, the capital raises that some of these firms have undergone. Yeah, yeah, we did one. So I think I think 2021 was like pretty big in terms of like Bitcoin mining financing. Um, so like I think I think you know when we look at like mining mining in China back then, um, there were many ways for those mining investors to to get external capital when they want to expand their mining fleet or their infrastructure. The only way they could was like go to lenders and pledge their Bitcoins for collateral. Get some leverage and buy machines and and, and was washed out pretty hard after the March 2020 uh, block shit. Um, but now we're seeing like 2021 is a lot of you know equity and debt financing. I think that for the first like three quarters it was more mostly like equity. Um, like the, the usual big names they they um, offered a lot of and at the market offerings for equity. Um, uh, so all the private placements. Um, and I think the last quarter was like an up, like uptake for, for like kind of convertible notes and I guess like debt financing instruments for the public market. Um, and and also along these ways, there's always there, there are a couple of you know institutional lenders uh, have always been you know trying to uh, negotiate deals with mining companies. 
we have we have a couple of them uh, currently, like Black Galaxy, Foundry, IDIG, um, Celsius, Block Phi. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting, like in the past, like a lot of these uh, US lenders, they will partner with Asia based ones to kind of, um, so they lend money to the Asia partners and then we'll, then they will issue loans to like miners and kind of structure the business like that. But now they're kind of becoming more actively engaging with the money firms directly. Um, yeah, and I, th I, I think that's gonna, maybe gonna continue throughout like 2022 and 2023, especially for companies that are trying to hold the Bitcoins and not selling, uh, you know, you, you still have CapEx and OPEX to pay. Uh, you have, and also when, 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 when the equipment that you pre-order last year gonna ship every month, you're gonna have monthly dues. And then you have, you're expanding your infrastructure. So there's so a lot of need for working capital. Um, so, this trend is gonna continue, I think. And, and the private lending market is pretty interesting. Like, um, you know, these companies, these companies are offering, uh, especially like crypto, I guess like uh, crypto lenders, right? So like Foundries and Galaxy, I think they generally offer like an interest rate that higher than what traditional credit firm will do. There were a couple of like, just one or two, not not too many, like Trinity and that's the company called Whitehawk. They they did some uh, small amount of equipment financing, um, but the interest rate was relatively lower. I guess I guess the Bitcoin price was a factor into that. But I guess like Fundry offer at least from the like thirty something deals that I reviewed, I, I saw and read through. I think Fundry was offering like seventeen percent interest rate per annum. Um, and it's a very interesting strategy. I mean, they, they, they themselves bought a lot of equipment early on in 2020, August. And then when they kind of sold this equipment to mining customers, there was a premium because Bitcoin price rallied and they also issue loans. If you don't have the money to buy the machines from them and you can borrow money from Foundry and then you pay a higher interest rate, but you can get the equipment swap. So it's a, it's a great access to resources. And that's something that traditional credit firms don't have. Um, so that's, I mean, that's kind of understandable that why their interest rate is also kind of moderate. Um, and also they put like a little bit more restrict terms in terms of like how the equipment should be collateralized. And you, there were also some terms like you can, like I give you, let's say like 30 million loan facilities you can only, you you only drew like 1 million of it and the, the remaining 29 have some some have some conditions so you have to you can only draw like maybe part half of that remaining amount before you complete a like say 100 million dollar trans, uh, transaction fundraise um and then you can draw drew the remaining half of it after you raise that money so to make sure that their the lender's risk is low, um, so it's a very interesting dynamic um, that has involved, I think, um, mining market. Definitely, it, it it does. It is in favor of uh, mining companies in terms of like even if you are small and you need capital, you definitely do have more alternatives than before in terms of sourcing capital or leverage. To take on that risk if you want to expand your business um because like before like say before 2020 i think most of the like miners in china the way to do is you know you you're a big miner you mine a lot of bitcoin then you convert them uh you you get more liquid liquidity to buy more machines um so it's like a self-fulfilling cycle whereas you where you don't really have any other leverage which is which is kind of not really risky, but now if you, like there are a lot, lot more options, right? Especially if you want to hold Bitcoin. There are also public mining companies that just say they, they, they don't hold any Bitcoin. Like Iris Energy said, they just sell, every, they just sell everything. Um, we, that's the strategy. We, we sell everything and we use the money we sell to mine more Bitcoin because we're buying more machines. Um, I think it's, it's good that, it's interesting to see that kind of different strategy. Like there are two spectrum. There. There's one that just don't sell anything. There's one that sell everything. There's a lot of companies in between. 
Um, so I think it's it's interesting to see how they kind of if if at all they will change if this year is going to be a bear market. Yeah, no, I'm really keen to see what's going to happen this year if there is a bear market or even just like a lower hash price for these uh, for these public miners. And I think the interesting thing will be in a few years to see like which strategy work, like hodling like your bit farms of the world or selling immediately like your iris energy. Uh, we can get to that in a second. I want to go back to what you're talking about earlier, though, with the private lending. What kind of interest rates are you talking about? Like, how high are these interest rates? And then what's like the the deal structure for these things? Uh, you and I were talking earlier about how you take out a private loan to buy machines from someone like Foundry. You pay a high interest rate, and then you have the deal structured. So if you fall out on the deal, that the Bitcoin is held by the custodian or is it held by the lender or yeah who is it held by so yeah there were a couple of uh, uh contrasts there was one example between foundry and Mawson infrastructure group that was that deal was early i think january 2021 it wasn't like a big amount it was like one million something and they bought a few hundred watts miners 500 maybe um so the, the structure was like the loan was 17, 16.5 or 17, I don't remember, but one, around that level, 17% uh, annual. Um, so they were trying to buy 500 watts miner and they put a small part of deposits. And then, so the total deal was like 1.3 million. So I guess one watts miner M30 was like 2,600, but I'm pretty sure when, when the when Foundry bought the M30s in mid 2020, it was definitely lower than that. Um, so they sold at the premium. I mean, the price rallied. So of course the miners go up. Um, so they so the total deal was like 1.3 million. They put like a 300 grand for deposits, and then they borrowed 1 million from Foundry, and with the 70% interest rate. Um, so the deal was like the equipment will be the collateral. Um, so it's essentially not your, like not your big, uh, not your watts miners, right? So you cannot really overclock them. Uh, there's like you have to gain like then the lenders uh, written consent before you can overclock them. And the collateral also re- includes the mined Bitcoin from this collateralized equipment, and the Bitcoin will be deposited to um, an address controlled by. Um, Genesis trading, um, presumably for like selling to cover the principles and, um, and interests. Um, yeah, that's that's uh, that's the the main gist of of the of the contract. Um, and also, they they're required to um, send the hash rate to the pool that is dedic- designated by Foundry. I mean, it's gonna be a Foundry USA pool, right? So it's kind of like you 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 pay a higher interest rate, um, but you get greater access because they have the machines, they have the pools, they have custodian wallets, and so. But then when that's done, um, I think the term was like eighteen months, if I remember correctly, eighteen months maturity. So after after that, I mean the the machine, the machine will be yours. Right? So you are kind of like paying a mortgage, right? It's like. Um, you're, you're using your monthly paycheck to pay back a mortgage that is upfront. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's that's what I think that's what crypto lenders would choose, uh, which kind of makes sense, right? They want to be more in, involved in kind of whole business strategy instead of just giving you a loan and collect the interest and we're done. But like, it's kind of a strategy that we bundle more deeply in terms of the business operations here. The interesting thing to me about what you're saying is like you definitely pay a premium for being within that enclosed system and like being a part of that a private lending group. So like Foundry for I think is like a great example, right? You get access to the pool, you get access to the machines, you get access to uh, DCG and all that stuff. You get access to uh, just like the entire system and all the benefits that it incorporates being a part of the Foundry family but you pay for that with that interest rate, right? That's 16 to 17% interest rate you're talking about, which is which is like almost outrageous when you're thinking about how 
cheap money is right now, right? Like the Federal Reserve itself is like scared to raise the federal loans rate uh, by like, you know, a few bips, like nothing yeah. at all. Even well, just that like, was that was back ahead. in January 2021. But I mean, mm-hmm. I, I guess like still it was pretty high. Um, but I guess like it's it depends on how you want to structure your strategy. I think at that time, if you get access to the spot miners, um, uh, the problem was like how how soon you can get the spot miners, right? At that time, there was like a supply crunch of the miners, so you don't really have any choice if you want to plug in right now, unless you wait. If you're gonna wait, then yes. I mean, if you look at like I did did a loan with the uh, the stronghold digital. I think it's that was also early, like first quarter or early second quarter of uh, of twenty twenty one. Um, and let me check. I think, oh, that was like around like June twenty twenty one. Um, so that was, that was like a ten percent um, from I think. Um, and also ten percent from another traditional credit firm. Um, but that that's also because like you know the the equipment they they play the 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 money they use to buy the equipment uh, the and the equipment was not spot at that point like they had to wait um so yeah i mean it's different like there's a reason why you pay for a higher premium rate it's not for nothing <laughs> i mean january 2021 there was not a better time to be mining bitcoin and so boundary by getting that those what's miners off their books was losing out on possible Bitcoin mining rewards in that pay, that place. So you have to cover your books with higher interest rates. I am interested to see though, and would curious to get your take on this. Are interest rates still that high right now in a possible bear market scenario or interest rates collapsing? And how does that look for these public mining firms that still perhaps have these higher interest rates on their books? but don't have machines deployed because of a logistics crunch. Is there going to be like possible wipeout scenarios? Do you think that there's a lot of danger for these firms because they're, they're, they're not online, but they still have these really high interest loans out? Well, I think like in general, I think Bitcoin mining companies, they have a pretty decent profile, like credit profile as a, as a borrower, because, you know, naturally if you have operating hash, you have, you have new Bitcoin that generated every month. Uh, regardless of the size, um, you have some new Bitcoin mining generated it's that, that can either convert it to your liquidity or, you know, in case of a price crash and you, you need margin calls. And so in general, I think as long as like you can, you can, you can plug in your miners like progressionally, I think that's relatively fine. I think for, for lenders, you know, it's also, it's also, like it, looking looking back from you know just deals for, uh, between Foundry and Moss in January, right? It's it was pretty safe for Foundry, if you think about it. It's I, I borrow I, I lend you the miners and you can plug in and you generate Bitcoin, and you will have liquidity to pay me the principals and the interest. Um, so I'm earning the premium of the miners and I also earning a safe interest return, and and I know you're generating Bitcoin every month, so. That's pretty good. Uh, I think that's this, 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 all these things that I think they work together as a whole, like the, the miners that you pre order, the infrastructure they're expanding, and the loan you're getting. Like, you, if, if you're only getting loans, but you're not moving anywhere in terms of your, your new operating hash rate and your new infrastructure, then yes, maybe you'll come a harder time when, when Bitcoin price crash. Um, um, yeah, I think I think it, it really depends on how you balance all these things. Um, so if you use the risk, the risk management is not really great, and, and then that again, that again would be we'll, we'll have some hard time. Um, and I think in terms of interest rate, I think recently it was great. I, I think generally it's not as high as seventeen percent anymore. Um, there were a couple of deals that were just seven, eight, ten, twelve. Um, one recent one was Isaac was 14% to Cathedral. Um, 
I don't know why. Maybe maybe because like they're relatively smaller players. Um, not too many asteroids that can be added like instantly. So, um, and also like there was one new lender like Securitize that company. I'm not sure if you're familiar. They do like digital asset security kind of platforms. They also have like a capital arm to manage like Bitcoin and Ether USDC yield fund product. It's also like they 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 get LPs to to put their money, deposit their money to earn interest, and then they would, you know, also lend the money out to charge a higher interest rate to make that profit, right? So same for like BlockFi, I think they also get deposits and then they also kind of lend out like a bank. Um, so I think there were there are definitely more players in the lending market. Um, so. As long as like mining companies need cash, um, it's definitely some business to do there. So the, the mining firms are safe is what you're saying. That's good to hear. Uh, <laughs> at least for the most part, even a, in a bear market, we could keep riffing on that, but uh, we only have a few more minutes with you. So I want to dive into machine manufacturers, which is definitely something you've covered for a long time. Uh, just like lay the groundwork for this for this part of the conversation. We have Intel announcing that it's actually going to build its new chip. Looks like it's a chip. Doesn't look like they're going to build their own machine. They, there's been some images online, but most of the releases today have said like Argo is going to pursue building their own white label miner, grid, same, block, likely similar. Uh, and then we have, yeah, yeah. And then we have like Bitmain, obviously, has been counterpunching with a bunch of new releases of his S19XP, S19XP Hydro. SNT Pro Plus Hydro, like a, a lot of different variants. Uh, that XP version, of course, with the five nanometer chip is a big thing. And then lastly, we also have some people in the ranks. Like MicroBT obviously was like a, a big up and comer in 2019, 2020, and really dug into the market cap for Bitmain. Uh, but they seem to be taking like almost a backseat in a lot of conversations I've seen so far. And then there's Kanan also lurking in the background trying to remake its image, especially in North America, where a lot of the hash rates migrating. So with that context in mind, tell me what you think about the manufacturing game right now. Is is it maturing? Is it taking a step forward? Or is information out there a little too hype beast and should be taken with more salt? Yeah, I think I think we're definitely this is like it's the more slow, right? I think I think we're kind of getting to that kind of plateau in terms of hash rate, like efficiency growth. Um, so, you know, back for like, what was in the S9? The S9 was 2016. So uh, six years. The efficiency, like three times tripled um, from 90 to 100 water trash to not like less than 30. So I think in the next six years, it's hard to see that that kind of same three X Kind of efficiency boost just by purely relying on chip uh, technology advancement. Um, that's also why, like you see, I think Bman is launching those like liquid liquid cool versions. They basically use liquid cool, and you already overclock them. So to max out to max out the the juice of the of the chips that would be on a, a air cooled machines, right? So. I think for Intel, um, yeah, it's, it's just interesting to see like when the actual second generation, what's called BZM, do uh, how the how the chip is doing, and also what who is going to be the the OEM to to make the full system? Because like based on the data from the first generation BZM one, um, they they definitely lack the expertise in in the minor full system design. Um, because like a chip was so, uh, 55 joule per terahash, and when it turned into a miner, it was 90 um 90 joule per terahash, so you lost a lot of the efficiency there. It's basically you, you put it's I think I think the way it was it worked is like it's not you 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 do put the 300 chips into a hash board, uh, four hash boards, but it's not just as simple as like putting them into a serious circuit. There are a lot of uh software and hardware design that you need to optimize so that they each chip can max, they can deliver their max performance in terms of hash rate and also the power consumption. 
So definitely from the, from the from the first generation of Intel, it, it wasn't that impressive. So, and yes, uh, it looks like they're gonna just sell the shit, and they and and different companies need to hire their own, like I guess OEM. And um, there was one interesting detail from the grid contract with Intel. But they redacted a lot of the information, a lot of the important details. But there was one part where it said Grid will get the license. It will will get a supply of the design, um, proprietary design from Intel. So of a system. So it looks like Grid is gonna also somehow look for different partners or kind of do, or do it out your their own to make the full miner. So how can they? optimize that system, the, the firmware, the hardware, the design. So that's also a question. Um, hopefully they can they can do better. Um, but yeah, in terms of like MicroBD and Bemin, I, cannot, I think I think I heard MicroBD is also trying to uh, have their own like kind of liquid um, kind of solution. Um, but like, yeah, my, like I think MicroBD generally speaking is in term business perspective, they're more conservative than 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 they, they they don't really go out and do large scale events, fly all the customers into Dubai and was it Dubai this year? Uh, last year. Um, um so they 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 yeah they they kind of cage you about because they're a Chinese company and they don't want to make too big of a fuss. Like they're selling enough com- capacity to their customers. So you know just do the business as usual. Um, but I think I think in terms of like hash rate, we're getting to a kind of a plateau, like it's kind of slower growth of hash rate increase. increase. Uh, we're not gonna see the kind of steep like jump from like six years ago. Um, but yeah, I think liquid cooling is also um, pretty interesting. Um, I think the only time that Bitman launched a like hydro. Liquid cooling was for the S9. I don't remember which year, maybe 2019 or 2018. But that was it. Um, definitely, it's definitely great to see like if this thing can be applied at a large scale. Like they, you know, now, now they sell those kind of big box where you fill those um, S19 hydro. Um, yeah, I mean, it just looks way better than immersion cooling. I mean, it's, it. Yeah. It's so it looks so clean and and not messed up. Like you don't need you need the tanks and you don't need the fluid and you need the pipes and, and all that headache. And you need to plus you need to customize the firmware. You need to dismantle the fans and you know with the liquid cooling, it's just it's firmware, stock firmware. It's a much better choice. But yeah, if if we can see a lot more deployment of those, I think there's also less noise. I do see a lot of the reports from the, from the U.S. like different neighborhoods complaining about those liquid mining facilities, like smaller ones, maybe the sites that are disrupting the communities. Um, maybe I think I think that's kind of an upgrade in terms of a technology. Just to jump in there really quick, I think that the U.S. noise thing I've noticed that too. And the block had an article about that yesterday with the Tennessee neighborhood uh, taking up some action against a Bitcoin mining farm. I think it's like an interesting corollary or at least a, a, an interesting part of like the China Bitcoin mining ban where all these miners would come to the United States and they were trying to plug in wherever they could. And now they're just pissing off people in neighborhoods who are trying to like live their normal lives. Uh, and I, I think that's it's funny because it's like definitely putting a bad taste in some people's mouth. Like the first intro they have to Bitcoin is like this horrendous, yeah. huge noise going on in their neighborhood. Like a, yeah, a I, saw, I saw a news report. Uh, there was I don't remember which company, but they they expressly said uh, when everybody is looking for the cities, we're not going there because we're because uh, you go across so 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 crammed and everybody's there in the big cities. We're we're going for those overlooked towns uh, where we can generate jobs and and all that. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It's there. There always be a community people just don't don't like the the, the vicinity of a mining facility that generate too much noise. Yeah, I mean, I think immersion and liquid cooling is definitely taking off in different ways. It's interesting to see like it's on the manufacturing side, but it's also on the proprietary facility side that you're seeing uh, both these things taking off. One's immersion and one's just like straight up hydro where it's built into the box. Uh, any predictions for what 
amount of hash rate you think in the next year or so will be immersion based? You think it's still just going to be single digit? Oh, I don't. I haven't thought about that. I mean, maybe single digit percentage. Um, but like, maybe it won't ship this thing until like maybe even later this year, or, or like Q Q and Q two next year. So, uh, depends on like how big the order is. Um, I'm sure it will be much more expensive. Um, than regular air air cooled. I guess nineteen. But it's it's already it's already overclocked. Um, so. And maybe maybe single digit. I don't know. I I, I just think it, we will definitely see like larger scale of uh, of kind of either liquid cooled or immersion cooled miners, um, which is which is kind of interesting, especially for for like immersion cooled. I think it's it always it's not so standard. Um, but if you buy like a hydro version, why like it's really standard because like manufacturers will have tested it already. They will make sure that it does deliver the performance but like if you do immersion yeah I, i'm curious like how i'm curious like how how how, how the data will look like um but he, i i think if we have like a seeing a larger scale of deployment it will have like a better results of the data to be a better reference for benchmark uh which was which will be also like kind of useful yeah i've seen like a few photos of ant spaces being shipped around the united states and wyoming and texas mm. so uh, i think it's s19 hydro pro for that yeah. setup probably not the xp yet uh that but that's one of the unfair questions i like to ask guests at the end of the podcast is mm -hmm. what percentage of hash rate will be based in hydro or immersion and what percent will be at home mining uh, we won't get to that one on this pod I, I won't put you on the spot there i think both of those answers is probably like lower single digits at the most uh wolfie yeah. i want to thank you for your time and what we can leave the conversation there thanks so much for joining us on the podcast and look forward to uh, reading your reports and talking to you again soon sure good to have you